Grace and mercy and peace are yours today and forever in Christ, your Savior. The word of the Lord that we consider together this morning is today's gospel from Luke chapter 16. If you had to trade places with one of those two men that Jesus describes, which one would you choose? First of all, think about that rich man who had so many good things in life. Had a nice house with a gated entrance, a closet filled with expensive designer clothing, lavish meals that he enjoyed day after day. He was likely respected in the community and had lots of influential friends. And then look at Lazarus. Had no money to buy anything. Had to beg at the rich man's gate just to survive. His body was covered with painful sores, and he didn't even have enough strength to push away the mangy, stray dogs that licked and irritated his sores. Now you have to choose one or the other. Would you trade places with Lazarus lying there, weak and helpless on the ground, dreaming of food, swept up from the floor for supper, maybe wondering why that rich man can just walk by you every time he leaves and returns home. Wouldn't it seem like a no-brainer to choose the life of the rich man with plenty of comfort and security and prestige and so many good things of life within easy reach? Who would possibly consider trading places with Lazarus? Jesus shows us someone who would do that in a split second, except it was too late. That rich man had completely miscalculated his wealth. And he found out too late that he had lived a life of poverty. How about you. Are you rich? Are you poor? Let's listen as Jesus today in his word directs us so that we can recognize and receive true riches. One year in confirmation class as I was teaching the seventh graders, I asked them that same question about trading places with Lazarus or the rich man. They thought about it for a little while. And they came up with what seemed to be a pretty good answer. They said, how about if we have the faith of Lazarus and the money of the rich man? And they could maybe even have pointed to, to Abraham, who is there. He was very wealthy, and, and he ended up in heaven too. But Jesus right here is showing us how difficult that is to do. A little bit earlier in this chapter, Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And we are caught right in the middle of this spiritual challenge. We need money to live in this world. We have God-given responsibilities towards ourselves and towards others that require money. It's important to save up for future needs. But it is so easy to cross the line to worry or selfishness or feeling better because we have more money or feeling worse because something has happened that's taken some of it away from us and and there we find ourselves bowing down before the money God and serving money instead of true God. That's what happened in the life of this rich man. I'm sure that he didn't set out early in life saying, I will live to worship money and forget about God. I will neglect spiritual things and the needs of others. 
wasn't his goal, but that's exactly where he ended up. Jesus doesn't want that to happen to any of us. And so we consider what he tells us about this rich man, who obviously with plenty of money never had to skip or skimp on things that he wanted to get or wanted to do. His life was filled to the brim with good things, filled so full that sadly he left no room for the best things, for the most important spiritual priorities of life. And that led him to make some spiritually fatal mistakes. First of all, he valued his body above his soul. His body was well-fed and cared for, but his soul was starving, spiritually dying. God prepares a feast of salvation, and he invites us to his banquet hall. In word and sacrament, he presents gifts of truth and mercy and love and peace and purpose and direction for life and the gift of eternal life after this life. But somehow this rich man felt no need for any of that, ignored his spiritual hunger, and his soul starved to death. Which led to a second spiritual mistake. He thought that he, instead of God, was the one who was in charge of his life. He didn't start out the day saying, God, help me to live according to your purpose today. Instead, it seems that his motive was, what do I feel like doing today? And so when he saw people around him, he did not look at them as others that that God was allowing him to serve. Certainly didn't view Lazarus that way. Now, he did not meanly order Lazarus to be removed from his property. He perhaps did not object when his servants brought out the table scraps for Lazarus to eat. But other than that, he simply did nothing. He saw the very real needs of another human being and figured it just wasn't his problem. He did not allow God's love or God's will to direct his daily life. With his money so close to his heart, there was no room for other things. And he may have thought that there would always be another day to turn to spiritual concerns. There would always be another day for that until there wasn't. The rich man died before he had planned for eternity. That reveals his third major mistake. He thought that time here was more important than eternity. And when his time of grace was over, he found himself in hell, in torment. And he didn't end up there because he had a lot of money. It was because he had set his heart upon his money. He had no faith in God. He had no concern about his sin, no thought about where his guilt would leave him in eternity. He despised the eternal riches that God prepared for him. Now, I think we realize that we don't have to be extremely wealthy for these temptations to affect us, too. We recognize how strongly these temptations that misled this man pull on us, too. Think of temptations to value our bodies more than our souls. Is it easier to maybe be more concerned about making sure we eat healthy food than it is to make sure that our soul is well fed? Is it easier to find time for physical exercise than to find time for prayer and growing in God's word? Think of temptations to to feel that we are the ones who are in charge of our lives. Do we always look at the people around us as, as ones whom God is calling us to serve? Or do we feel that strong temptation to 
to live more for ourselves and for what we would like to do. Think of temptations to value time here and, and short-term things above eternity. Do we sometimes feel more bothered if our favorite team loses a game than if a loved one is in danger of losing Jesus? Do we maybe give more thought to making sure that our money doesn't run out in retirement than we do to making sure that our faith doesn't run out before our final breath? We realize how many and how strong those temptations are as Satan is asking us to bow before the money God and forget about those true riches that have value for life and for eternity. Lazarus had those true riches. You know, we really shouldn't call him poor Lazarus. He's really the rich person in Jesus' story. Lazarus knew God's love that sent him a Savior. Lazarus knew that his Savior came and lived every moment of time here with eternity, the highest priority, with our eternity, his highest priority. Lazarus knew that Jesus had come to make himself poor, to spend every cent of his life as he suffered and died to pay for the sins of the world. Lazarus knew that made him rich. He didn't have to see himself as a beggar, locked out from everything good. Certainly knew that he was not locked out of God's presence. And he knew that as fancy as that rich man's house was, it was a shack compared to the Father's house that awaited him in heaven. He knew that all the gold and all the silver in the world could not begin to pay for the gifts that God had given him in Christ. The gift of being a child in the family of God. Gifts of mercy and peace and forgiveness and eternal life. And that allowed him to know that godliness with contentment is great gain. In faith, he could endure hunger and difficulties as he trusted God's plan for his life. And even though there were lots of good things of life that he lacked, he knew that he had the best thing in life. And he knew that when he would close his eyes in death, in faith in Jesus, he would open his eyes to eternal riches in the presence of his Savior whom he trusted. And all of those gifts, all of those riches are yours in Christ. When the rich man from hell could see Lazarus at Abraham's side in heaven, he was still hoping that, that Lazarus could, could serve him kind of the same way he viewed Lazarus here on earth hoping that, that Lazarus could bring him just a, a drop of water to relieve some of his agony. Abraham's response underscores the fact that nothing can ever bring any relief or comfort to the sufferings of hell. That's what Jesus came to save us from. He did everything to give us the gift of rescue from judgment for our sins, and he does not want us to put off that concern until it's too late. And so that rich man thought about five of his brothers who were still on the earth. And they were living the same way that he had, living for themselves with no spiritual concern. So he suggested that Abraham should send Lazarus back to earth to warn his brothers. Abraham said, why? That's not necessary. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. So they already have spiritual treasure. They already have the word of God in which God has given us everything necessary 
to save us from sin and to give us the gift of eternal life. All the riches that we need right in God's word. And that rich man was pretty sure that something more spectacular, something more special than the Bible would work better. But Abraham said if they won't believe God's word, they won't believe even if someone from the dead comes back to them. God's word is that spiritual treasure and spiritual powerhouse. God's word brought Lazarus to faith. God's word is that out-of-this-world treasure, heavenly treasure, that God delivers to us. There's a Bible verse that describes it as the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. It warns of judgment to turn us away from sin and repentance. It, it showers us with mercy and grace and peace and forgiveness as God uses that message to create faith and to cover us in Jesus' righteousness and to guide us in living as God's forgiven children. God in his word showers spiritual treasures and blessings upon us, filling our lives to the brim with those things that truly matter so that in thankfulness we can serve God alone. And so that we can use earthly things like money or time or energy, considering them as gifts of God, to be used trustingly and generously to serve those who are around us. For all of eternity, sadly, that rich man lamented, if only I had listened to God's word. If only I had recognized the real treasure of God's forgiving love in Christ. Today and each day is our time to listen in humble faith and obedience. In the book of Psalms, God's word is described like this. The decrees of the Lord are more precious than gold. Every day is our opportunity to, to lay hold of more of that spiritual treasure that God gives us in Christ. In every worship service that God invites us to, he pours out that spiritual treasure to fill our lives to overflowing with his grace and mercy in Christ. And that means that today and each day is also our time to recognize the needs of others and not to pass them by but to consider your hands to be the hands of Jesus that can bring help and comfort and relief to those who are in need to let your lips repeat Jesus words of love and truth so that others too come to know the riches that are theirs in Christ. Each passing day brings us 24 hours closer to eternity. Each day is your day to recognize and receive true riches so that you live and die and live eternally in Christ who made himself poor to make you rich. Amen. I invite you to stand. And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And you may be seated. The Apostles' Creed is a summary of the teaching of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It really is a statement of spiritual riches, one after the other, of what God has done for us and what God has given us in his saving love. We declare the Christian faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.